Ten Weeks in Africa had an unusual start in life. I think with most novels, the characters are sort of gestating and evolving in the writer's mind for a long time, and you can't really say when, it, when they began. But with Ten Weeks in Africa, I actually I started with a quite concentrated burst of research. It wasn't four years ago, it was quite recently, actually. It was, you know, three years ago. Two years ago. <laughs> <laughs> two years before publication, before it was accepted as a manuscript. So um, that was a little bit odd, and the book does not reflect my personal experiences. It's not my ten weeks in Africa, and I'm not Ed Kane. The two principal English characters in the book, Ed Kane and his wife Sarah, reflect this complexity. They combine thoroughly good motives with professional blind spots. They want to do the right thing, but they want to be seen to be doing the right thing. They have an acute sense of guilt about Britain's colonial involvement in East Africa, but they also have a curious ambivalence about some very dreadful things going on right under their noses here and now. They also, I think, suggest in their motives and attitudes the range of overlapping impulses that have been at the root of much Western activism in Africa, both in colonial times and since then. For example, Sarah is a bit of a romantic she has a Rousseau-like, or we should now maybe say a postmodern tendency <laughs> to think that, the, yeah, to, to idealize African, traditional African culture while demonizing Western culture. Her husband, Ed, is more down to earth. He sees the problems of poor societies in essentially technical and economic terms. And I suppose this downplaying or idealization of cultural factors, I would say, is their major blind spot. I'm not sure that that makes them naive, but it does mean that they're vulnerable to the traps that are being laid for them, because they don't have any way of understanding fully what's going on around them. A very different figure from Ed and Sarah is Joseph Kamunda, the uncorrupt, though circumspect and cautious, senior civil servant, who is seconded by his government to assist Ed with the project. Joseph has paid a high price for his refusal to take bribes over the years. When his wife became ill with cancer, he couldn't simply put her on a plane and take her to Britain or America, which is what his colleagues might have done. And when she died, he had to raise his daughter Beatrice single-handed on a civil servant's modest salary, a situation which has confirmed his natural tendency to keep his head down. To avoid any discussion of corruption in the context of development and poverty, I think it's obvious that you cannot enter into the lives of the poor or look at things from their point of view without trying to understand the human impact of such behaviour. It's easy to imagine the fear and misery that this kind of petty corruption, what they call in Kenya the Kitu Kudogo, the little something, causes somebody like Stephen and his family who already have too little to live on. But one has to wonder too where all the money is going. Often the answer is that officials, policemen, teachers, doctors, nurses, lawyers, businessmen who extort money from their clients <coughs> and from the general public have themselves paid large sums for the privilege of being able to do so. For instance, a man like Sergeant Maburu will go heavily into debt, owing money to his wider family and to loan sharks, in order to buy his way into the police force. Once he's got his uniform, he's under an obligation to extort money as fast and efficiently as he can to keep his creditors at bay and to distribute cash to his family. Here is Pamela Abassi talking over dinner with Sarah Kane. Every child has to contribute to the household income, Pamela went on when she'd swallowed her mouthful. It's essential. Survival depends on it. A child who strikes out on his own, let alone her own, is letting everyone down. If someone does that, he becomes an outcast, a non-person. And in this city, let me tell you, girls who lose their family's protection end up as prostitutes if they live long enough. She drank some more wine. Most women in Africa have no idea of a life outside the family. The family and religion are the centre of life for most people. They are operating within the limits of necessity all the time. There's no room for manoeuvre. But you Westerners, you never understand this, never. You cannot imagine a worldview so different from your own. Either your incurable romantics who look at tribal society and say, oh, how beautiful, how authentic, 
We Westerners should never have come here and destroyed this wonderful way of life. Or your liberals, progressives, who see the power of unelected old men in the tribe, the low status of unmarried people, the sexual taboos, and you don't like it. You start asking, who are these self-important wazi, these elders? Why can't the young people be free? Why are the girls locked up in the family compound until they marry? What about their human rights? She fixed Sarah with her fierce, protruding eyes. You see, we Africans can't win. We're damned either way. And these days, we have to listen to lectures from postmodernists too. Ridiculous people, determined to maintain both positions at the same time. Tribal society and personal freedom. Feminism and a warrior society. Don't ask me how they do that. God only knows. As the story unfolds, it becomes clear that the corruption is not confined to Africa, but operates through a rising series of institutional systems, from the humble policeman, Sergeant Maburu, to the local businessman, Solomon Uko, to the big man or big woman, Pamela, in government, and on and up through the Western donor powers, the NGOs, and the agencies of the United Nations. 